and this news anchor was sitting there and and he just was stumbling all over the place and then all of a sudden he just stopped for a second he's like okay now i'm better let's go on with the news <laughs> he's like then we're back <laughs> you know? i'm so uh, glad i got that on recording <laughs> <laughs> that needs to be That's the, the opening. You are that the needs to be the opener. Oh. Yeah. All right, and welcome back to Street PX, a live broadcast because we're actually doing a Google Hangout right now, uh, or at least maybe for those that are watching right now, if you're listening to the podcast, uh, we missed you. So keep an eye out for our future ones. Anyway, this is Street PX, a photography podcast focused on reported, you know, street documentary photojournalism. My name is Casper, and uh, as a very special treat today, we have a special co-host. Hey, how you doing, folks? Um, my name is Pete Rosos. I am a photographer around the area here, and I make pictures with film and digital. Yes, and if you uh, take a look at all some of our past episodes, you'll notice that Pete was a previous guest on our show. So if you want to learn a little bit more about him, we'll be dropping that link in the show notes so you can go back and listen to his episode directly following this one. Uh, but definitely, thank you so much for coming and helping out. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. <laughs> and big love to Jim, who's out on the East Coast right now, and that's why he couldn't join us this uh, this go. But it worked out well, because Jim's not necessarily a film shooter, but Pete is. I, I hope I can fulfill that for you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, first thing I want to do is just throw out some love to our sponsor, Glass Key Photo. That's San Francisco's premier analog photography store. And uh, if you have been under a rock for a while, they have changed location from their Hate Street uh, facility over to Sutter and Van Ness, right there at that corner. And it's a beautiful location, isn't it? Yes, yes. <laughs> also, the uh, meeting point for our film walk that's happening here tomorrow, or uh, as you're listening to this once it posts on Saturday, uh, we're getting together at 2 o'clock there at Glass Key Photo if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area for the Film Week Photo Walk. And if you're not in San Francisco, get some people together. If you're in Houston, if you're in Miami, if you're in Chicago, whatever it uh, whatever location that is, get some people together, lay the the digital up on the shelf and shoot film. Agreed. Yeah, uh, you, you got. There's just something about film, and that's that's why we do this kind of film week thing each year, uh, which we I, I want to do more. Challenge yourself, folks. Take take one week out of every month and only shoot film. Exactly. Give that a shot and see see what that does for you. You're going to be surprised in, in, in how you're going to feel about it after you, you, you try it out. Um, but on that note, we do have two, two, two contests going on this week as well, uh, or at least for the next month. First contest is for all of you uh, natural film shooters. Go over to the Street PX Lounge and share your film scans over in the in the lounge and and hashtag it with film contest. And uh, at the end, uh, once it wraps up for our fiftieth episode, we'll announce our winners there in October, October twentieth. Uh, and uh, the best uh, best photos get some free prints. And from what I hear, I think Nick's got some prints. Nick Mayo, who's on the show today, has got some prints he wants to share. Uh, second contest is going to be a, uh, a social media uh, sharing. So go and follow us on Facebook or on Twitter and and share our, our show, our most recent episode here, um, to your friends and followers. And uh, we'll, we're going to take a, a list of everybody that has followed us, has liked our Facebook page or shared our posts. And there's going to be a big drawing for some free film, some T-shirts, all kinds of stuff. We just want to give away a bunch of shit. That's, that's our goal. That's our goal. So anyway, that's our contest. Here's our plugs. First plug is Jay Blakesburg, um, who uh, you, if you've been following the board, we just sh had an uh, interview with him. Jay is a rock and roll photographer that's been shooting for about 40 years now and has an uh, intimidating client list from Tom Waits to Neil Young to Jerry Garcia. He followed the Grateful Dead for years and years. This guy is a legend in the music scene out here in the Bay Area. He's got a uh, career retrospective show coming up to the Harvey Milk Photo Center in November. That opens up on November 9th, going until January. Opening receptions on the 9th. He also has a lecture and a show and tale going on in November 11. Uh, but you do have to sign up for that one. That That's limited uh, limited seats. Um, but that's at the Harvey Milk Photo Center in San Francisco. 
Yeah, and uh, what we got going on over here in the East Bay, if you're around this area, uh, there's a new collective out there called the East Bay Photography Collective. Um, they are obviously, by their namesake, uh, based here in the East Bay. Um, it's a fledgling collective, um, but they already got a set of workshops uh, up there. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because if since we're talking film week, um, these guys actually have a lot of film-related stuff. Uh, uh, they have a workshop, for example, um, uh, that uh, uh, teaches you how to develop your film in beer, wine, whiskey, or coffee. Uh, they have another uh, 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 workshop that's specific to large format photography, large format film photography, um, and uh, it's 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 not your average workshop, um, but uh, go check them out. Uh, they have uh, a fantastic sort of scant website, but uh, enough of the information you need at uh, ebpco.org. Uh, they also have a Facebook group that uh, you can join up at. It's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash E-B-P-C-O. Um, it's uh, uh, started off uh, by a guy named Vince Donovan. Uh, he, for the longest time, uh, was one of the co-owners of Photo Booth SF and the Mission, if any of you guys remember that back in the day. And uh, they, they, they have a lot of interesting things coming up, specifically film-based stuff. So go check them out. Cool, cool. And the last thing and uh, the most uh, appropriate thing here we want to plug is Nick Mayo. Our guest today has a wonderful exhibit going on. It's uh, it's a part of the Art Prize that's there in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, and if it comes to town there, it's going to be at the Ferris Coffee Trust Building uh, September 20th through October 8th. So if you want to see some of his work in print right in front of you, eye to eye or eye to print, Go check that out. Um, so enough about the plugs. We want to get right into this episode and, and start talking to Nick. So we want to welcome him and uh, thank him for taking the time to sit with us and, and struggle through this live show with us. So uh, how you doing here today, brother? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're, we're slowly kind of getting into the, into the live <laughs> flow here. <laughs> sure. I completely understand. I'm trying to get accustomed to this whole broadcasting thing. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't do any better, so I, I commend you for, for having to deal with words in live. Yes, yeah, it's it, it's always better when it's polished, but that's okay. That's what it, that's what editing is for for our Friday episode. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got in touch with you through a mutual friend of ours, Steve Abbott. He was actually the one yes. that, that led me to your front door, and um, I got to taking a look at some of your awesome channel over there, Nick Exposed. Um, it's hey, on thanks. YouTube, yes. Um, but fellow lover of film, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, and we'll kind of get that kicked off. Yeah, so I'm a, a film photographer based out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, I host a YouTube channel called Nick Exposed. Uh, Nick Exposed is kind of my my branding uh, across the board. So Instagram, Nick Exposed, YouTube, Nick Exposed, and uh, I also have a Facebook page, but that kind of gets populated with all the Instagram stuff. Uh, but yeah, I just I, I am a lover of film and uh, just absolutely love pouring into the film community and uh, just helping whatever way I can. And the YouTube channel has been a big way for for me to just give back to this amazing community, especially within film uh, that we have. But, um, what first got you into photography? Yeah, so I come from uh, I mean, I've been an artist ever since I was a kid. I used to draw and I mean, just doodle and everything. Uh, but I kind of took this path to where. Uh, I was doing sales jobs, marketing jobs for a while and decided that I wanted to go back into just artistic, creative expression and uh, thought that that was going to be through web design. I was really enjoying building websites back when it was just CSS and HTML. So started making some uh, some business claims there and, and started into business for uh, web design, then transitioned over to graphic design. Uh, and then naturally transitioned over to photography after taking photos for different clients, graphic design and, and websites, and just kind of really found my passion in my artistic expression through uh, photography and then into film photography. Well, what was the impetus that got you into film? What was the what was that key moment where you're just like, I think I'm going to pick up film? Because it sounds like um, you were you started to get interested into this type of thing when digital photography was still young enough where you could go out and you could do it. Um, sure. Uh, what 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 made you what made you gravitate towards film? Yeah, you know, I, I thought back multiple times about this question, and 
uh, I do know that there's a certain point to where, uh, you know, these these filters and different things were coming out to where people were trying to emulate film. And I'd never known what film looked like up until that point, except for, you know, the, the prints that we'd get back from CVS when I was a kid. And uh, that <laughs> that's not exactly the, the greatest representation of, of what film has to offer. But uh, just going through and realizing that I was, I was looking for something greater than just what digital had to offer. And uh, instead of having to go through and apply all sorts of different effects and uh, different presets and all sorts of stuff, I just kind of figured why not go and, and kind of explore the original medium and, uh, and really kind of trace the roots back to, to where it all started. And uh, I mean, over the last four and a half to five years, I've, I've gradually switched over to, to film more and more. And then in the last three and a half years, it's been essentially 99% of the stuff that I'm shooting is all on film. Uh, majority of my personal work is on film and I just absolutely love it. It kind of it kind of captures to just expand a little bit further. It kind of captures just the the soul of the images that I'm trying to uh, to present out to the world. I, I'm a grain junkie, and uh, <laughs> the more grain, the better. Uh, T Max 3200 is by far my all time favorite black and white film. In my my film fridge next to me, I have about uh, 36 rolls of it still stuffed into my freezer, and I kind of trickle through them every every now and then. You mostly you, when I'm you would be absolutely jealous because uh, one of the actually the sponsor of the show Glass uh, Key Photo um, about a week and a half ago they uh, uh, posted a thing up on Facebook. Um, they got several bricks of the T Max 3200, oh. uh, which expired only in 2014. And oh wow. Um, it had been in the freezer the whole time. So it was literally oh, just like, ah, ah, <laughs> and we have something in common because that is when, I don't know if you remember, it was like uh, about a year ago, Kodak announced that they were going to bring back uh, one of their Chrome films mm -hmm. and uh, people were all agog about that. I was not happy about that because <laughs> look, Chrome film is beautiful, no question, colors, all that type of stuff. But if we're talking about usefulness, Please, why did you not bring back the 3200 T Max? That's right. Yeah. Best it's... high speed ISO <laughs> film ever. It is amazing. It's incredible. And it has so much soul and life into it. And I, I use it like almost solely for documenting family work. So uh, my wife or my nieces, or anytime I get to be around uh, just family, I pull the T Max out and, and just get to. To just, I don't know, there's just something to it to where it just embodies so much just soul and characteristic that uh, you just, I haven't found in anything else, even pushing films. So, yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, I know exactly what you mean. Oh, well, it, it's funny because about four months ago, I went back into my film archives from like 20 years ago. And uh, back then, I used to shoot the T Max 3200 a lot. And I went to go scan some of the stuff in. And after 20 years of time, that film held up fantastically. It mm. scans beautifully. And then when you go in the dark room, it prints just stunningly gorgeous. And I'm, sure. you know, I think we can both, you and me can both agree <laughs> that Kodak should bring that film back next. Oh, for sure. It's so much easier to focus when, when everything in the, the shot is just grain, you know, <laughs> like trying to, trying to find focus in the dark room. It's like, oh, I got it. I know that I got it because everything is structured to it. So, so what it's kicked beautiful. you into uh, 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 street photography? Uh, that that's a probably an answer that I, I don't necessarily know how to approach. I think I just stumbled upon it when I got into photography. It was uh, when I really took like a, a big step forward in it. I was doing a three hundred and sixty five like photo a day challenge, and uh, really kind of stepped into that. And I just kind of naturally gravitated towards the city, and naturally gravitated towards. Uh, stuff that was constantly happening. I don't like, I mean, it, not that I don't like uh, landscape and, and different work like that. I enjoy shooting it when I'm in the right area. Uh, but in West Michigan here, at least within the, the 30 minutes to an hour radius of where I'm at, if I'm going to do landscape, it's going to be either a farm town or, you know, just some rolling hills that I, I'm not necessarily blown away by. So kind of becomes redundant. <laughs> exactly. Like there's only so many pictures of barns that you can produce before they all start <laughs> to look the same. Like, oh, there's another haystack and, you know, like. Macau. <laughs> <a> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, and 
at the same time, I had moved away, and when I got back in, or when I got into photography, I was moving back to Michigan from Virginia, and coming back into a city that before I kind of thought was just plain and mundane, uh, reapproaching it with a camera in my hand really uh, allowed me to fall in love with the city that I'm in. And uh, that I think probably played hand in hand with falling in love with street photography too, because it gave me a, gave me a voice to be able to approach the city in a way that I'd never done so in the past. So, uh, and then interacting with people. I absolutely love people. I love interacting with people. So getting to go out there and, and shove my camera in their face and kind of force some of them to interact with me is, is pretty fun sometimes too. Hey, you, look at me. <laughs> yeah. Hi there. I go, uh, yeah, I host uh, like meetups and photo walks and a lot of the times I'll host them out in Chicago and a lot of the guys that go with me out to Chicago have never shot in Chicago before and they've never shot in a big city and I'm no stranger of getting in people. I'm not Bruce Gilden by any means, like. I, I, I'm not like, you know, assaulting someone with my camera, but at the same time, I'm definitely close and I'm definitely within distance to where after I take the photo, there's still a decent amount of time for them to be able to interact with me. They haven't walked by me by the time I've gotten my photo. So people, uh, people that go with me on these photo walks tend to find, uh, my style a little abrasive, but <laughs> I, I kind of love it when people, when people approach me and they're frustrated because at the end of it, Nine times out of ten, I'll leave with a new friend, and they'll be happy with it in the end. So we, You say Chicago. Let me ask you, where, what part of Chicago are you going to? Are you taking them? Uh, like into the city. We, we typically start off around uh, Central Camera and just kind of work our way out. So the folks that you bring out on the photo walks, are, are these folks that are um, from the area around there, or are they uh, just come from Grand Rapids as well, or do um, they come from different I mean, places? There, there's some of them that come from Grand Rapids, but it's mostly the Midwest Uh I've done a couple different meetups and they've grown each time and uh, they're either from Chicago area or I've had some guys from Milwaukee come down. I had some guys from Detroit come over and uh, so they're, they're just kind of all over the Midwest. But uh, Chicago is a, a nice little place to kind of break people into street photography if they've never really stepped into it. That's and, true. And, yeah, I think what is it? Chicago has a, a very different vibe, I think, than well, I mean, every every in, in, every place has its own vibe. Oh, it's, well, um, Chicago yeah. Chicago has that uh, big city but Midwest feel. Sure, like sure. The, it, there's a dynamic there that's hard to recreate. Yeah, it's it's quite a bit different. My wife and I recently went out to New York, and it was my first time visiting the the big city out there. And being to Chicago so often, uh, I kind of thought I knew what to expect going out to New York, but there's, it's completely different. Uh, I mean, it was, it, I was in complete culture shock. We were out there for four days and we solely went out there. It was my 30th birthday and we went out there so that way I could use all four days to just shoot. And for the first like day and a half to two days, uh, it was really just me kind of being overwhelmed by the city, not having any idea where to point my camera. <laughs> I kind of just wanted to like curl up in a ball and just cry in a corner somewhere and be like, just bring me back to Chicago. I don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming you landed in uh, Manhattan. Uh, yeah, we started off in Manhattan. So yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> I talked about it on the show before I, I spent six days and put down about 70, 80 miles and cause you just walk and you never hit the end. Oh, for sure. It's crazy. It's, it's absolutely insane. And it, I mean, I left with this like dissatisfaction of going, I kind of expected going and coming back with, I mean, I came back with a lot, I shot 32 rolls of HP five out there. Uh, but I kind of expected coming back, having experienced at least enough to walk away and go, yeah, I experienced New York, but I left going like, there's no way, like I haven't even touched the surface. I, I've, you kind of licked it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I, kinda, I don't know. It was, it's such a, but it's left me with this desire to go back so many more times. And I want to, I want to just fall in love with that city. And I just want to document that city so much. So, yeah. 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 Now, uh, you were talking about your wife while ago. Now, you guys do weddings together, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Is that what uh, you do to kind of keep the lights on? you professional wedding photographer? Yeah. So, uh, I work a, a full-time job during the day, and then, uh, and then my wife is a full-time college student, so to supplement her income, uh, we've taken on weddings for the last three years full-time. Uh, and I, I say full-time, it's, it's kind of full part-time. I mean, we do about 12 uh, to 13 weddings a year, uh, but even that with Emily being a, 
I mean, she's a full-time art student, so she's constantly creating, and I'm constantly creating. So running the YouTube channel, doing my personal projects, working a full-time job, and doing weddings uh, has definitely become, you know, it's a, a part-time wedding gig, but it's also full-time in a lot of ways. It just keeps us busy, so... It's a calendar full of text. Yeah, it's, it's, I hate looking at the calendar because it's like <laughs> so daunting. And I didn't like, it wasn't until about a year and a half ago that I actually used a calendar anyway. I just kind of like did mental notes for meetings, be like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll do lunch next Wednesday. And I tend to remember that kind of stuff, but. Write it on your arm. Yeah, <laughs> I started using the calendar and then now my calendar is mixed with Emily's calendar and. I'm just looking at it and it, <laughs> I just want to like, I get up in bed and I look at the calendar and I just want to roll back in bed and go, nope, I'm, I'm done. I'm like, well, just, okay. <laughs> I, I, I have a little bit of bad news for you uh, as someone who's talking from the early forties, <laughs> sure. the older you get, the more important that goddamn <laughs> calendar gets. I'll oh, tell I bet. you that right off the bat. I bet. That's truth. That's truth. Are nope. you shooting film at these weddings? Yeah, we do hybrid. So any of the uh, bridal portraits, anything like that, I do on medium format film. Uh, I, I did a wedding three weeks ago for another film photographer and he really just let me go to town. Uh, not too many couples will allow you to deliver a bunch of grainy black and white photos of, you know, the ceremony and reception and everything like that. But, uh, he was all for it. So I shot quite a bit of film at his wedding. Well, I, actually, one of the things that I noticed, um, I saw in, in one of your videos, um, you had mentioned, I believe, something about shooting most of the weddings in color. Mm -hmm. uh, your personal stuff is in black and white, and, and the wedding stuff that you do is in color. Sure. Um, uh, uh, is, is the color a factor? Could you elaborate on, on why you have that difference between shooting color for the weddings and shooting black and white personally? Yeah, you know, I, I think just naturally my mind goes to gravitating in a direction of, like, splitting things off. Uh, I need to know what is work and what is play. Uh, and I, I feel like anytime I'm working with color, for the most part, I am working on a personal project. It's, it's kind of a long-term here and there project with color. But for the most part, uh, my color or my professional work is going to be done in color and my personal work is going to be done in black and white, uh, which is fun because when I do incorporate black and white into weddings, like I said a couple weekends ago, getting to shoot a lot of black and white, HP5 pushed to 1600, which is my jam. Uh, it it kind of brought me into a place of being able to play at a wedding, and that doesn't happen too often. And I can't do it at every wedding, but but yeah. So I I think that that's probably the main reason. Otherwise, it's just I I mean portraiture. I enjoy doing portraiture in, in color. So hopefully that answers right your on. question. Well, I want to just kind of shift us over to Nick Exposed. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about your show here. Um, just kind of started out. When did you first decide, hey, let me jump on front of the camera and start talking about film? So I actually originally started recording videos last summer. Uh, did some vloggy stuff, kind of like uh, just being inspired by Casey Neistat and that whole thing. Uh, tried just doing like the day in the life of type stuff. And I recorded probably four or five episodes of that, never put them up, uh, never got fully through editing them and realized that that was a format that I wasn't going to be able to, like it just wasn't going to be sustainable and it wasn't necessarily me. Uh, and then I kind of put it on the back burner because a lot of the equipment that I was trying to use for that, I had like a, it's probably in my desk somewhere around here, but it's this little Canon power shot from a while back and it was just a 780p and it didn't handle uh dark situations very well and um yeah i i don't know i just became like kind of crippled with this fear of of not having the right equipment and everything like that and then this year i just made the plunge into going you know i'm just gonna i'm gonna dedicate myself from doing this and only using my iphone to record all the videos and uh, not be consumed by the quality of the videos, but be consumed by the quality of the content. And uh, really just made the step and made it happen. So uh, the idea was birthed long before last year, um, but it didn't actually come into uh, to happening in a, in a big way until March of this year, I think it was. Excellent, excellent. And you're mostly talking about um, the use of film, uh, inspirations, things like that. Does that sound like the kind of the core of what you're aiming for? Sure, yeah. It's, 
You know, I, I say it's a film channel and there is a lot of talk about film. The community that I attract is very, very much film photographers. Uh, but I, I get messages every week from uh, people that are just starting into photography and digital and they're like, man, the, the stuff that you're covering is, is speaking to my heart so much because I like, I don't do gear reviews. It's, I don't think anything wrong of gear. I, I love talking about gear, but at the same time, I think there's already plenty of voices out there talking about gear. And there's only a, a small handful of voices that are going into why is it that we're creating the, the work that we're creating? How is it that we're going to get to the places that we want to be? And what does that actually look like? And I, I like I was, how I explained it to you the other day. I, I like going into the meat and potatoes versus talking about the forks and the knives. Yeah, that's that's our thoughts, too. I mean, gear will come up, obviously, but, you know, we'll talk a little bit about it and then shift back. This show might be a little different because it's film based because we're going to get into scanners and stuff here soon. Yeah, but uh, no, what I can tell you personally, one of the things that I liked in in, in watching uh, several of your videos is it tends to be so much more substantive. Hmm. Um, You know, the the whole notion of like, okay, um, we can talk about gear, we can talk about film, we can talk about this. But what what is the end game? What are you trying to? to to ultimately express with the work that you do and you tend to focus so much on that um it's please keep making stuff like that please (laughs) thanks yeah i I sure (laughs) will i feel like the the industry advances when we talk about uh you know gear but the craft and artwork advances when we actually talk about you know the reasoning why and i I think there's place for both i'm so excited by you know the all of the different companies. I mean, Yashica is toying around with coming out with new stuff, and then Polaroid just relaunched, and uh, just oh, yeah. all, you know all these different things that are th- there's huge moves that are happening in in film photography right now. It looks like Kodak's really putting a, a large foot forward back into the film community, and every I mean, not that they ever really stepped out. They've been doing Vision Three for for so long and offering that to the prosumer, but. Uh, yeah. I just I'm so excited about that and that does come from from talks about gear so I think there is a place for that but at the same time if all we focus on is gear then the the art form and the craft is going to die. Yeah. Yeah. I, it always comes back to that you know it's, this is a great pot roast what stove did you use? Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but well okay and and one of the things that I find out there is that a lot of folks who who do a, any kind of photography blog whether it's uh uh, film centric or digital centric it's you know very rarely do you have people want to talk about the substance of 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 the work itself sure. you know to talk about the meat and potatoes and not the forks and knives yeah. right you know people like to talk about these are the forks and knives and here's how i use the forks and knives sure. and uh, isn't the luster on these forks and knives really amazing <laughs> and with these forks and knives i can cut through this kind of meat and that's that's about as much as they'll touch on the meat but in terms of the meat, and, and uh, that was something that I found really fascinating when you started to go into um, zines and how to make a zine mm-hmm. and how to think about zines. Um, uh, uh, I noticed that you tend to take uh, – I'm assuming that, that the graphic design background probably plays a little bit of a role into how you uh, uh, put, the, uh, put this stuff together. Sure, absolutely. Um, but, it, but the main focus usually seems to be, okay, I have an idea – and I really want to express it, and that should be the focus. You know, okay, sure, I shoot HP5, sure, I shoot with this, um, but that takes a backseat towards, you know, okay, here, here's the artistic expression I'm trying to let everybody know about. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's fascinating. So, uh, how, like, does uh, the graphic design element play a role into how you started to get into making zines? Sure. I actually, I honestly would say that graphic design plays into so much of my photography, not just zines but also the way that I lay out my compositions I like I oftentimes gravitate towards simple compositions but with very striking graphical elements right I like to use light and shadow in a very I I don't necessarily I see it as light and shadow and I fully recognize it as light and shadow but I I see it as shapes and and objects to play with Uh, but then going into the zine portion um, understanding Understanding the flow of how, how something should move, understanding the layout and what an actual solid layout will do for the reading experience and for the viewer experience. I mean, when you think about books are presented in a way that uh, I heard Ralph Gibson talk about it uh, in another episode of something. But uh, what did he say? He said, when you go to an exhibition, you're showing people how you shoot. And when you, when you hand them a book, you're showing them how you see 
or just, you know something like that to where it's it's when you're handing over a book you're handing it over in a sequence and in a way that you're going this is how I want you to approach the the work and there's there's really no other way that you're going to be able to approach it than the way that I lay it out and that I'm forcing you in down this river trail of of my work if that makes sense and I, I just think that you know coming from a graphic design background I've I've I, I break things and also from a marketing background I, I break things down in a very different way I find and I, I hear from a lot of people that the way that I'm breaking down not that it's any kind of like savant thing or you know I'm not trying to elevate myself I'm just saying like this background has definitely played into uh, breaking things down in a way that I know it's going to flow well I know it's going to direct the viewer's eye I know that they're going to land on this page and then go back to this page so how am I going to design the two to play off of each other and how is those two going to build to the overarching story if that makes sense well, actually, I, I, you were talking about the jazz, mm -hmm. using music to uh, in one of your videos on setting up a sequence. Sure. That was extremely fascinating to me, just the way that you described it, listening to the music and using that uh, uh, the imagery mm -hmm. to kind of create a musical element. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, you know, I think there's a point to where we, we start to become just paralyzed when when we have so many different options, when we have so many different ways that we can go. I mean... You can, you can approach a zine in a million different ways. Uh, but when we, when we hone in on something and we kind of give ourselves that, that constraint and that self-imposed limitation, uh, I, I oftentimes approach my work through the thought process of, of music. Uh, I'm not a musician by any means. I don't really have the language to put towards music. But at the same time, I know how music makes me feel and I know how I respond to music. And when I, when I take that structure and I lay that over top of my composition of a, of a zine, of a book, of an exhibition, all of a sudden I could start seeing in patterns that I wouldn't have gravitated towards in the first place, but I've constrained myself to those set of patterns, and all of a sudden the story starts to flow on its own, if that makes sense. Oh, that makes yeah. uh, to me that makes wonderful sense, in the sense of I think... Um, um, it, it, well, let me ask you this... Um, is there a particular rhythm that you feel? And I know that's, I'm getting maybe a little esoteric here, but um, in, in terms of when you have an idea of, of something that you want to work on a project, um, you know, obviously there's an inspiration. And for example, I think with your zine, it had to do specifically with uh, this sort of jazz music feel mm -hmm. um, that you did. When you go out, to shoot that from the time that you go to edit the stuff to the mm. time that you start to make prints and arrange these things, is there a particular type of rhythm that you feel in every single process where that idea keeps repeating itself in the back of your head and eventually comes out that way? Or is it just something that happens more spontaneous sure. uh, as, as you go through uh, everything? You know, I I'm think getting, it's, I'm pretty deep here. I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> it's I, this fascinating is, <laughs> to me, though. Pete, this is where I, th my mind goes to these places as well. I love these types of questions. This is exactly what I love talking about. And I, I think for me, at least, it's, it's definitely a natural progression. I, I feel like my mind just kind of, it, it finds these, these grooves and it, it finds, you know, just the, I, I just fall into a pattern to where, like, all I can listen to is a single music, right? Like uh -huh. lately in the dark room in, in in developing and everything, I've just been listening to classical over and over and over and over again. And uh, I not that I not that I made the work that I'm approaching right now through that mindset, but in approaching the work, I can't help but to fall into that mindset. Right? And I, I think it, it kind of the the reality is on the Chicago zine, the first one that I did that's built off of jazz. If I would have said, hey, you know, I want to build it off of a Black Keys album, I could have done that just as well. Uh, but at the same time, I was responding to the place that I was in at the moment and the things that I was finding inspiring at the moment. And the story came from that. Uh, I mean, that same story could be told a million different ways. But I don't know. I, I just fall into a natural groove of, hey, right now, I'm, I'm all I'm listening to is, is Chet Baker and Bill Evans, you know, in like, just like grab it, or all I'm listening to right now is Vivaldi and, you know, Chopin, and it, it's weird, but it's just how my mind operates, and I just get into these things, and I just like embracing them and seeing kind of what 
is influencing me and how I can partner with it at the moment to, uh, nice. to create a body of work. Oh, that's awesome. That's, it, it reminds yeah. me, it's kind of like a time capsule. When I look back at, I, I, I have the, sorry, I have the zine right here, right? So if I go back through my kind of town, um, it just brings me back to that place that I was in, right? I, I can experience the jazz songs that I was listening to. I can, I can hear Miles through this, you know, I can hear Coltrane through this. And, and it just puts me back in that place that I was. And I kind of like that. And I kind of love being able to offer just my experience in, in these pathways that I've found out to other people to experience as well. Well, I think you also did that in, in that same video when you were talking about my kind of town. You, you, um, I think you had made mention about uh, um, if you get the chance to put on this particular type of music uh, while you're looking for mm -hmm. it, um, you know, is that, is that part of the idea of what you're, what you're getting at here yeah, with this? Yeah, you know, yeah, and okay. I, I hope that and it was, it's encouraging to hear when somebody reaches out and goes, dude, when, I, when I'd seen the zine, like, I could almost see a musical pattern. And then when I heard, like, I, I, it made sense to me, and I put an album on, and I got to approach it, and I... I had so many people after that video who had purchased the, the zine beforehand and there was very, very, very little text in the zine and actually the only thing that referenced jazz was uh, the beginning quote of Bill Evans. Um, but when, when people heard that and they reapproached the zine with, you know, Miles on in the background or with Bill Evans on in the background uh, and then they came back to me and said, dude, it, it just bloomed out like a flower and I got to experience it in a whole new way. Like that excites me, you know, like it's incredible. Nice. You think about when a, when a song comes up it, or a smell, things like this. So mm -hmm. being able to, to bring these two elements together, I think just builds something greater in the end. Sure. There's a, there's a bit of nostalgia, you know, yeah, that just yeah. naturally happens. And, uh, I, I love having just these little pockets of time. And that's why I, I do like focusing on zines because zines could be made in a, a much shorter time than actual book projects or anything like that. What do you find is the advantage of a zine over a book? Uh, it's more approachable, you know, like I, I have four books that were just released by photographers that I absolutely admire. And, uh, right now I, I'm not able to, to pull the trigger on too many of them. And, uh, they're limited editions. So by the time I am able to, they, they're probably going to be sold out, you know, uh, so I like that they're more approachable. I love, uh, having different, uh, price points for people to approach my work. Uh, I do think that there's, there's definitely a place of galleries and showing work and being able to sell it at a, uh, you know, what we would see as a fine art price point. Uh, but then I think there's also a place of, I want as many people as possible to be able to own these projects. Um, and to be able to approach these projects. And my end goal in general is that people were to approach my, my work in print form. So why would I make it an unapproachable price? And that's not a commentary on anybody's book or any, like those are justified price points. It's just, I can't always afford that. And I know that not everyone else can either. So I think a $15 zine, a $20 zine, a $10 zine uh, is much more approachable and oftentimes accomplishes a very similar end result. Right. They are a, a way of being able to access photography without having to deal with a 60, 70, or if you were just talking about limited edition, if you go to a great bookstore and get a, a signed Kadelka. Right. $250, $500. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, well, okay. Are you, are you planning on doing any more uh, uh, videos talking, uh, going uh, more in depth about uh, uh, zine making or, yeah. or, or going into that kind of thing? Yeah. So I think as of right now, I have maybe four or five in the series right now, but uh, I have a few more. I'm going to be doing a, a layout video of how I actually lay them out to send in for print. And then uh, actually this nice. week I was, I was brainstorming on another video, much going into what we were just talking about, about this idea of how is my graphic design background really shaped and directed that I want to offer to people who doesn't, who, who don't have that language to put towards things who don't have that experience to put towards things and break it down in a very simple, uh, almost here's a toolbox for you to pull from. Uh, here's how you can direct viewers eyes. Here's how you can work with common shapes and common tonality or anything like that. So, um, I'll probably even break down some of my, uh, favorite books in my collection and how other photographers have done it extremely well in my opinion. So that's one that, uh, I want to 
record. This winter will be a, a big point for me to be able to record much more of that as winter, as uh, Michigan hits with our blanket of snow. <laughs> yes, as, as you get that lovely lake effect snow that yeah. makes you like, no, nah, I, I don't want to walk two feet outside of the house, right? It's, it's crazy. Like some days it's absolutely beautiful outside, but then you go out to shoot and it's your hands just feel like they're going to fall off even though you have gloves on and you can't even hit the shutter anymore because, yeah, your finger's frozen. It's just it's brutal. A, <laughs> it's a kind of wind that uh, your, your skin's not the only thing that coat. It cuts right into your bones. <laughs> totally. <laughs> It's what polar fleece was invented for. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so here, here's something for you. So if, if you're coming up on those winter months and you know it's going to be freezing cold and you know that you're going to be kind of limited in terms of getting out there and, and, and doing a lot of shooting like you normally would in, in the mm -hmm. better months, um, do you have a dark room you can go into and print yeah. some of the stuff? <laughs> and that's, that's I, been the thing. Yeah, it's, so I just started printing with the, in the dark room uh, maybe a month and a half, two months ago. And... Uh, finally, finally convinced Emily with the help of a, a friend who had a similar setup to what I built, uh, that it could be done in our little apartment and not take up an entire giant space, you know? And yes. so to, going back to talking about the, the New York trip that I recently took, uh, actually you guys can see it behind me. There's probably about 15 rolls of film that are developed over hanging on the wall back ah. there. And then I have, uh, maybe another 25 that need to be developed downstairs. My typical routine is going into the winter going, you know what, this winter I'm actually going to shoot. And then I get into the winter and realize I don't want to shoot. And it just puts me in this <laughs> giant state of depression. And I just like, I curl up in a ball for a while and just go into hibernation. So instead of that, I said, you know, I'm going to really challenge myself in a way that I've never been challenged. Normally I'm very much, I got a pack on. So normally I, I shoot, I develop, I scan, and it's posted up on Instagram within that week, you know. Yeah. Uh, I said, I'm not going to approach the New York work uh, apart from the dark room. So I'm not going to scan them in. If anything, I'm going to scan the prints in and that will be it. So that's going to be my big project for this winter, as well as some zines that I'm putting out and some YouTube nice. videos. So, so how, how did you first, uh, uh, started learning about uh, dark room stuff? Is it something that you just researched on your own or did you, did, did you go and find a, Is there a place in Grand Rapids where you, uh, uh, where they can, you can study this stuff and you can rent out a dark room or, um, so yes, there, there are some evening courses that you could take for darkroom printing. We have an art college here in town. Emily actually goes to the art college for her degree. But uh, it was mostly just through, I mean, it, not even mostly, it was entirely through YouTube. Uh, I think okay. I looked up Ted Forbes' video on it, and then I was like, yep, I, I got it. I'm going to run with it. And, <laughs> and I just fumbled my way through it. But luckily, I, I actually had some pretty good success right off the get-go. So. And, and, and I don't mean to be rude or nothing, but, but how, how much of Murphy's Law did you run up uh, into <laughs> when, you, when, when you started doing this? It was, well, I, you know, to be surprised, I'm actually blown away by the, the fact of how, I'm not going to say that I found it simple because that, that <laughs> is false. Uh, but I did not hit as many snags as I, I anticipated that Good. I was going to. Apart from a couple times of leaving the lens open, you know, to you know f4 or whatever versus stopping down or uh i haven't exposed a whole bag of filler of uh <laughs> paper or anything like that so it's there been good go. yeah we were we were just talking yesterday about yeah you know, some people when they're first starting out with a dark room they don't really realize that the enlarger is a camera into itself exactly it's it's just it's it's something that goes it's literally the opposite way around where you know with a camera you're pulling the light in to expose the surface exactly. um, you know the the enlarger which should in its own right is a camera is literally blasting light out to uh you know imprint a a, a surface on the outside sure. um but it it's hysterical to me because um i'm i'm working on setting up a dark room uh, it's a little bit more difficult to do uh, uh, out here in 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 the Bay Area because of infrastructure and, mm. and crumbling this and and building codes and this that and the other or, um, spa or space. Yeah. Well, okay, but the the wonderful thing that yeah the wonderful thing that we, that we do have is um, there's still something of a plethora of uh, places that have rental dark rooms. Mm. And um, it's always fun to go to these places. Um, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, you, you always can figure out the folks who are just starting out at this and, and they're not necessarily paying attention because you'll have someone like you're sitting there. Um, the, the, what is it? About a week ago, I was in the dark room and I was trying to print triptychs on one single uh, uh, sheet of paper. 
and dude comes in and he has to check his Facebook thing every five minutes oh, in the dark room. And you're like, okay, look, <laughs> like, please, <laughs> please, I please guess. You, you, everyone you, else in this place and you're like, you're like, put please. your addiction to the side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So those kinds of things happen. So, all right, that's that's cool. Um, it, okay, which th- there's another question uh, uh, for you. From building the zines to developing your own film and now mm-hmm. to getting into printing, uh, you seem to be addicted to the tactile experience of things. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Talk about talk a little bit about that. Sure. And I, you know, I think it's a very common thing for us film photographers to say of we're process driven. I think it's become almost a buzzword, but. Uh, at the same time, it, I I just miss the idea of craft, right? I think of my, my grandfather who passed away years and years ago and just my grandmother finally moved out of the house that they were in, but for the longest time his, his wood shop in the basement was untouched. And just going down there and seeing the, the pieces that he had made with his bare hands, right? The, the things that he was crafting with his bare hands and I... My other grandfather did that as well, and I mean, it, it just seemed like it was a thing of that era to where everything was done by hand and done, and then we've moved to where we rely on computers and we rely on technology and we rely on our tools, which is not a bad thing. Like, I enjoy relying on part of my camera for weddings and not having to think too much technically, And but at the same time, with with my own work, I want it to be a craft. I want to have crafted something from the start to the finish, right? I want to be able to uh, speed up my my agitation process if I want to induce more contrast or I want to <laughs> slow it down if I want to reduce the contrast or, you know, these different little, like, these tweaks that we can make in, in the whole process. When you get to that final print, whether it be, even if somebody's, you know, scanning in and printing on the ink chat, when you get to that final print, you know that you've crafted that thing and that, that you're actually offering something to someone that, that you've spent time on, you've labored in, and especially in the dark room. I'm, I'm going through paper left and right trying to figure this stuff out. And I'm like, <laughs> I, you know, I, okay, I dodged too much. Now I got to go back and I got, you know, and trying to figure these things out. And when I do get that final print, I look at it and it almost brings me to tears because I'm like, here you are, my little baby. I, you know, like I've, I've poured into you and... <laughs> now go off into the world and do your thing, you know. So it's uh, yeah. It it's well, okay. That, would you would yeah. you say that's like a sense of pride, a sense of accomplishment? That's personal, sure. you know. Not something that you're going to be like, look at what I did. I made this print, and aren't I awesome because I made this in the dark room? <laughs> sure. It's a thing that you say to yourself of like, you know, you look at the print, and you're like. You know, and then you think back how much time, how much thinking you have to do. Okay, I need to shave a little bit of time off here. I need to dodge here. I need to burn there. Sure. And then you look at it, and it's like you said, it's your baby. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and, and it's not necessarily something to brag to other people about, but that sense of accomplishment that you feel like, you know what, this is the image that I had in my mind, and here it is on, on an actual piece of paper. Sure. Right. And, and, and through the chemistry of it, right? Because what is photography? It's, it's all about the light sensitive nature of things mm-hmm. that's not to knock inkjet prints or or, or uh, printing cmyk in general i mean that's been sure. around for a long time too but there is that beauty of oh my god like this isn't ink this <laughs> right. is this is chemistry and you burned this stuff like on sure. the surface it's amazing um and there's something to take pride in that a, a real personal sense of uh, uh of accomplishment with that i'm i'm rambling now I'll- no no it makes total sense it's it's like you're not you're not dealing with ones and zeros or dots and lines. You're you're dealing with organic substance that that yeah responds to the thing. It I, I don't know. I kind of think about it in this way. And not again, not to go too esoteric on this, but uh, the the material is responding to the very thing that I responded to in the first place. The thing that grabbed my attention and stole my heart in the first place that made me pull the camera to my eye. The the film plane, you know, like you have your your emulsion that's responding to that same light and then you get to to represent that light onto another emulsion that that you know like silver gelatin gets to respond and all of a sudden there's a a series of responses along the way versus a series of decisions i made the decision not the can i don't know and again that's a little a little 
lofty in, in thought process, but at the same time, I like that kind of stuff. Well, okay, lofty, but it also gets into that whole idea of what what is an enlarger for? Mm-hmm. An enlarger is built for a very specific purpose, sure. right? Um, whereas, and, and again, I, I don't mean to sit there and say that, that digital is, is bad and or anything like that, but, you know, with, with my computer, with my laptop, where I edit my digital stuff, um, you know, well, that's also where I go take a look at Facebook. That's mm-hmm. also where I get my emails. Uh, but the enlarger, I'm not going to go and read my news on the enlarger, right? <laughs> you know, the enlarger has one, you know, what I'm trying to get at is um, it's, it's that singular, every tool has its own particular sure. process. Sure. And as a result of having to follow the steps of that process, it, to me, it focuses mm-hmm. um, just exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish. And it makes you think hard about, okay, what am I really doing this for? Because do I want to blow a crap ton of money on paper and then have nothing to show for it? <laughs> right. Right. Um, or do I want to make this right? And how do I make this right? What am I making right? And, and what's this eventually going to be? And, and for me, it's a thing. If you think about that stuff all beforehand and all of a sudden the ideas start to come and foment from, from uh, going through the process that way, that tactile thing of working with instruments that have a dedicated purpose to them sure. again I'm they're not rambling. being used for anything else yeah oh it's, yeah it's a good thought process i like that you know another point of it too is uh talking about this whole idea of going into the meat and potatoes right talking about the whole idea of thinking thinking deeply and thinking intently on on our artwork on our craft on our photography on what we're trying to offer to the world uh so much of life has been filled with busy. We were just talking about schedules a, a little bit ago of how our schedules get so filled up. And But when you make time for developing film, when you make time for uh, the dark room, it gives you that silence that, that oftentimes we're lacking in our life or oftentimes we're quick to fill with, you know, Facebook and, and the phone. But you, you can't. <laughs> you're not going to pull out the, well, unless you're the, the guy in the, the, you know, community darkroom that you're dealing with, but you're not going to pull out the phone and, and approach it. It gives you time to actually think about the work that you're creating. It gives you time to approach, you know, your thought process and uh, really what it is and why it is that you think about the things that you do. And I just, I, I, the more silence that I can get in my life, the better. <laughs> <laughs> Concentration and focus, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It makes a difference. <laughs> well, let's get a little technical here. Just a quick sure. question. Coming back to the developing thing, you a metal or plastic guy? Uh, plastic. As far as developing tanks? Yeah, Patterson tanks. Uh, and then I have some other tank that the tank works well, but the reels are absolute junk. So I don't know. I'd prefer Patterson over everything else. Yeah. You're more of a plastic guy too, right? Uh, it, depends on, it depends on which uh, uh, format of film. Oh, um, 20, for, yeah, for for a thirty five millimeter, I'm I'm all plastic just because it goes so much faster. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the 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 downside to that is is, um, I mean you have to have those reels like spot dry before if you even want to think sure. about putting putting the film in that drives you nuts. But I mean if you have a system, you work the system out. Mm-hmm. And for me, the plastic goes faster. Um, it's a bit messier when you're agitating the tank, mm-hmm. uh, because no matter what those, the, there's no real good seal on those, on sure. those, yeah, those stupid Patterson tanks. Um, but, uh, medium format film, give me the metal tank because, um, the, the thin, you know, how thin the film is on medium format. If you start to get a little bit of a, a, a snag in, mm-hmm. in the plastic reels, it just bends the living hell out of the film and it can actually damage the emulsion side mm-hmm. uh yeah. badly and so it's like okay give me the metal reel because it, you know there at least i know um there's less of a chance that i'm going to damage the emulsion on that sure. and if we're talking large format photography um I, i've got this lovely thing it's i i always blank on on who it is it's actually it's a guy out here in california um, well, the, is it the, I think the SP 45, uh, 45, it's this small tank, oh, plastic like the tank with grenade, the sheets. Yeah. Yeah. And that like that, that's, that for me was like the God it. Cause it used to be this gigantic brick where yep. you would have to pour like, like, like a liter and a half of chemical in there to, to be able to cover everything. Now it's just like, you know, like half a liter and, and that's and all good. the chemical you need. And you're developing four sheets in one shot. Sure. And I'm like, yes, this is brilliant. 
This is brilliant. We can do that. Um, so plastic metal, I'm I'm either or. I'm. Uh, it it depends on the format. Let's put it that way. Sure. I'll have to try um, the the metal ones for the medium format. I stopped shooting medium format for my personal work because, like, I like sanity and. Uh, <laughs> 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 I, 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 I was saying words that I normally do not say when I was, you know, and my wife comes in, she's like, hey, what's going on? I'm like, I'm doing medium format. And she just goes, oh, yeah, okay. And Emily's developed film in the past and is printed in the dark room, too, so she just knows. I just hate, hate, hate having to get into the dark bag and try to load on 120 film. It drives me nuts. Have you tried it on the metal uh, on never, the metal reels no, yet? No. Oh, tr- try it on the metal reels. Seriously, I it does. It 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 it's infinitely easier than doing thirty five millimeter on a metal reel. No sure. question. I'll have mm-hmm. to. Yeah, I had some reels too, some reels and tanks back in a while back, <laughs> but I just gave them away. I was like, hey, if you want these, you can have them. But I'm sure I could find some more on Craigslist or something. Oh, that's probably one of those uh, mail room giveaways, huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which actually, you guys out there listening, you do have to take a look at Nick Exposed because um, he's got a smorgasbord of different types of shows. And the one I'm alluding to is uh, he, explain it a little bit. People will send you zines or or prints and you get to show these on your your video stream, right? Yeah, so I've just been super grateful that that people have just responded to the channel extremely well. And right from the get-go, people were reaching out asking for... uh, an address if uh, if they wanted to send anything in and uh, since then I've I've gotten tons I don't know you could probably actually see there's a giant stack of mail behind me <laughs> that has zines and prints and uh, people sending cameras uh, and it's incredible I mean somebody sent in a Holga somebody sent in I mean a Nikon FG all sorts of stuff I'm waiting for someone to send me like a Leica M3 uh, so if any of your listeners want to, uh, to nice. <laughs> just follow through with that, but no, it's, no, it's been incredible. It's now send, send that M3 to street PX. <laughs> <laughs> actually, we're, we're good. I, I'm okay. <laughs> you know, I, I was going to say, it's like, actually, I think, you know, Nick, Nick's got the Christmas wish list there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no. So, uh, so yeah, people have sent in stuff and, and now I have kind of like a little, little pile of cameras and. Uh, I hesitate to say that because now I'm going to get a bunch of people reaching out asking for cameras. But I do have a pile of cameras that uh, will be in future giveaways and different things like that. So uh, yeah, that's what the contests are for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which uh, not to tangent, but we have a contest going on uh, right now where uh, it's not as cool as yours, where we're giving <laughs> cameras away, but we are giving art, as in prints and Thanks. film. Um, so if anybody out there listening goes and follows us on Twitter or Facebook and then share some of our stuff that puts you into the drawing to win some nice HP five, um, or maybe some tri X. I don't know. Kind of depends on it. It's going to be something good. I'm uh, sorry, but not the 3,200. Uh, nope. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoarding that. I'm hoarding that like a bitch. I mean, yeah. pardon my language, but I'm hoarding that like a bitch. No, I feel you. I don't believe you let us give that away. <laughs> I'm not letting no. I thought about it. I thought there was a point. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll give two rolls and donate to film. And then I'm like, no, this is why you crazy. They're never making this film again. Sure. Just going to pop in real quick to throw some love to our sponsor, Glass Key Photo. This is San Francisco's premier analog photography store and a staple for many photographers here in the Bay Area. If you're looking for analog gear, repairs, film, old or new, amazing zines by local artists, or simply want some great company and the opportunity for some fun photo walks, this is the place to be. You can find out more information and upcoming happenings by following them on Facebook or Twitter by searching Glass Key Photo or visit their website at glasskeyphoto.com. Now, after five years in the colorful and historic hate district, they have relocated closer to downtown. You can now find them at 1230 Sutter Street. That's between Polk Street and Van Ness. It's a fantastic new venue offering a ton of space, breath of fresh air, I'm sure, for not only Gordon and Matt down there, but all photographers here in the Bay Area. Above all, while in San Francisco, be sure to visit Glass Key Photo and give a big hello from all of us here at Street PX. Well, jumping back uh, over to the show, I, I wanted to go ahead and switch us over to, this is going to be a big tangent a, a shift here, but um, scanning. Sure. We kind of match a little digital with a little bit of analog. Um, me, me and Pete were <laughs> talking. I guess. Yes. Me and, me, <laughs> me and Pete were talking about this here recently, and, uh, and we actually got a question from the uh, YouTube channel there. 
Um, but as far as for scanning, are, is that something you're doing or is it mostly dark room? Uh, so I do scan. I, scanning was the process for me for the longest time. Like I said, I just picked up the dark room about a month and a half, two months, maybe three months ago. Um, but as of right now, I'm, I'm focusing more on dark room just to one, give myself something to work on through the winter, but two, to be able to approach my work in a, in a way that I've never approached it before and to be a little bit more selective on the way that I'm making my selects. But uh, I love scanning. Uh, I still scan. I, I'm scanning through the uh, HP5 shots that I did at that wedding a couple weeks ago. And uh, scanning is a huge part of the workflow still. Yeah, what are you using? Uh, so I have a pack on uh, F135 Plus over here. And then I also have an old Epson Perfection 3170 flatbed that does well enough with medium format, especially. Yeah. What were you going to say? No, I, I was going to say flatbed scanning. Uh, um, yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the Epson works well enough. And then, <laughs> yeah. but the only problem is it's like, okay, hold on a minute, though. You know, sometimes you look at it and you're like, you look at the dusting job that you want to do. And again, this kind of goes back to the uh, done versus perfect. Mm. That is sometimes if, if you forget to clean off the uh, the surface of the flatbed mm. and all of a sudden you have like a thousand dust specks on there and you're like, oh. <laughs> then you're yeah. like, okay, what are the alternatives? What, your other scanner, it, um, is, is that more like a, is that more like a cool scan scanner or? Uh, um, um, so kind of in a way, it, it, well, Actually, Believe it or no, not, not, I'm not familiar with this type of scanner. So, oh, really? Yeah. The Pacon. It's it has a bit of a cult following. Uh, okay. The Pacon is kind of the one that that it's a dedicated 35 millimeter scanner. Yeah. Uh, if I could, I'd, I'd lift it up and show it to you right now. But uh, it just it does, has do a, a little bowl in the front that it catches the film, so it just scans the entire roll through, and then it feeds out the other side, and then oh. catches in a bowl. And okay. uh, it's it's pretty incredible. I use the TLX uh, external software. It's not the software that was originally made for it, okay. and it allows for uh, just some extra goodies to be pulled out of the the film. So, because I would I would love to try and see if you know, how, can we can anybody win the lottery and possibly like you know uh, purchase like thirty grand worth of uh, <laughs> drum scanner? Oh, I know, oh, man. Please, <laughs> seriously. Like, I, I just had one of my uh, one of my thirty five millimeter nags drum scanned over at Indie Film Lab, and because I uh, in an exhibition we hung this week, and I wanted to print it large, so I printed a thirty five millimeter nag up to I think it's forty four by sixty eight, and uh, on the drum scan, I mean it's it's grainy anyways. I like I said, I, I love grain. Yeah. I pushed Delta one hundred to four hundred for this particular shot. And the grain printed beautifully. I mean, at that size, it was incredible. Was it nice and sharp? Yeah, it was, it was really sharp. The drum scan just <laughs> nails it. The, the pack on that I have, too, it, it, that's it's like especially what it's known for is just the incredible, incredible uh, sharpness and grain structure that it's able to scan in. Well, if we're talking scanners. Well, there you go. Nice. Here's a... Uh, I, what I'm showing for everybody that's just listening in is a my Minolta Bellows system. What do you hook um, that up to? Uh, funny enough, I actually use a, a converter to uh, Minolta to Olympus. Okay. And I use my old Micro Four Thirds. Oh, that's fantastic! <laughs> I, so, I actually I seen one of those over on uh, in the case over at the. <laughs> that's awesome. Over at the case in uh, in the camera shop. Does it work well? Yeah, it actually, I mean, it works for what it needs to. The only problem is, is the, the macro 50 millimeter that I've got on here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was a victim of eBay. Mm -hmm. So I, I got a wonderful macro lens that the aperture is stuck at F like 11. Oh, <laughs> so you got to supply plenty of light in there. Yeah. So if I want to change the aperture on this thing, I've got to like smack it around. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was only like twenty bucks. The whole system nice. itself together was like seventy five dollars, and nice. and it came with everything, like the little uh, the slide scanner uh, piece here, the rolls, so I can actually I don't have to actually cut my film. Sure. I think that's probably my favorite part is I can just run a thirty six roll film through here without cutting it, and then just you know store it later. That's amazing. That's Which cool. how how are you storing yours? Uh, very terribly. I don't know. It's, 
I, I do not have a good system. People have been asking me, "Hey Nick, can you make a can you make a YouTube video on how you archive your negatives?" And I'm like, "That'd be the worst YouTube video ever." <laughs> like, I just put them in the the plastic archival sleeves, and uh -huh. uh, honestly, I have about probably 130 unmarked archival sleeves from this year. That <laughs> um, I've got about yeah, I'm in the same ballpark. I, I was marking them pretty well earlier this year, but then I just kind of fell off, and yeah. The best, well, okay. The be the best way to do that is, and and this, yeah, it, it always becomes a difficult thing. Go, get, but if you can, if you can uh, uh, get the scratch together for it, find some uh, archival binders uh, mm -hmm. um, where the those folks who still make them, they're like the plastic binders that actually buckle closed. Um, I have an entire wall of those. Uh, at my place, and it drives me insane because I always look at it and I'm like, you know, oh, uh, <laughs> like what's going to happen if something catches fire? <laughs> um, Gone. <laughs> you know, but I mean, you'd still, the, the idea is, all right, now you have to try and keep this organized. You have to try and figure mm -hmm. out how you're going to layer this stuff. Um, going back to the whole tactile experience and, and, getting, and, and doing a hands-on process, well, um, you know, here you go. You have to let's let's order this in the best way possible. Yeah, I think that's one of my big projects for this winter too. Is, is going back through and I've luckily all those all those uh, archival sheets have been scanned in and I I do a very good job at cataloging my scans. Uh, so I could go back through and it's just going to be a tedious process. I'm just terrible with organizational and administrative stuff. So I just wish that I could outsource this stuff as as much as possible, but I'll just have to figure out a system. Do you do you sometimes make uh, digital contact sheets? I haven't. Oh. Okay, so if you get yourself something like a big enough uh, tablet or just a simple light table, sure. Um, and you have uh, photo software because now I think a lot of smartphones are capable of shooting in the DNG RAW format. Mm. Um, if you have that kind of phone or JPEG works just fine, mm. but as long as you have some kind of photo editing software that gives you curves, oh, sure. um, what you can do is you just lay the transparent negative holders on top of either the light table or, you know, a completely white screen on a tablet. And then you just photograph the, uh, uh, you photograph the negative and then you go into the photo app and you reverse the curves and you have, you have a digital contact sheet that, is going to save you a lot of money in paper because I'm sure you found out in the last couple yeah. months, uh, you know, darkroom paper, like actual photographic paper is not cheap sure. and making contact sheets is literally just like, well, that's throwing money out the door. <laughs> um, that's one area where I will actually take the digital over the film is when it comes to making contact sheets, I sure. will, I will use this little tool and do that all the time. Nice. That's a good tip. I like that. <laughs> to that point, um, I recently come across a friend of ours, uh, Mike Padua had, uh, had suggested a cool application that's in, uh, it's being cooked right now. It's called Film Lab. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, their anticipation is both iOS and Android, but it's a, a app dedicated to film scanning. Nice. Um, using like a light, I'm sure you like Box or something like that, but um, it's fascinating. I am sure it's going to be more on the contact sheets side of things like what Pete was talking about. I sure wouldn't want to rely on my cell phone to give me uh, sure, my, my exhibit. Yeah. <laughs> that day is coming sooner than you think. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, Nick, Nokia and their way of trying to come out with these big camera lenses on the, you know, the big bulge. Yeah. <laughs> I give them credit. I mean, you never know where the future, wait till, uh, Lytro and cell phones come together. Yeah. Right. <sighs> I, I do tell people, like, people ask me my favorite cameras all the time, and apart from my Leica, my, my iPhone is probably my second favorite camera. I, I just absolutely, there is kind of a mystique to the, the iPhone lens and, and everything that I could do with Filmborn from Maston Labs and Snapseed. That Actually, my current zine that I'm working on is all photos taken with the iPhone. and So, I don't know, I, I kind of like that they're trying to pack more into the, the phones because it, it is one of my, my cameras that I still kind of revert back to it um, from time to time. Yeah, a lot of a lot of people are doing it. Um, what is it, Scott? Uh, Scott Strazanti. Uh, Scott Strazanti just released a book um, from the hip, and it's all mm. iPhone shots. But this is a guy who 
Um, I mean, he works. Uh, uh, he works for the San Francisco Chronicle, Pulitzer Prize winner photographer, with and with stuff. all the gear like you wouldn't believe. But he just released a book of only iPhone uh, awesome. iPhone photography, yeah. so it's 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 spreading. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I, I yeah. don't know. I think it has the imperfect qualities that that I love in film too. You know, so it kind of <laughs> has a a romance and mystique to itself. So. That's an interesting concept. That's it, it's a- accepting and and warming to the little quirks and instabilities. Totally, I, I feel like if if you were to ask me if I were to go out and shoot street with uh, either my 5D or my iPhone, I'd probably pick the iPhone every single time. It's just one of those things, yeah. Oh, I sure, it never I crashes would. on me. Yeah, I forgot to see if we actually have any uh, wonderful listeners out there with anything to tell us. Yeah, I put up the window for that. Uh, yeah, I did too. Um, I had a question here from Manuel. He says, uh, any tips for seeing a scene in black and white? Nice. Mm. So I'll let you take that uh, torch and run with it. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> I think the, the biggest thing is, is learning to see in tonal range. Uh, I mean, I, I search out light first and foremost, and I search out good light first and foremost. Uh, I mean, I, my black and white photos, I like to have a punch to them. I like to, to have a certain amount of contrast, even if uh, the day isn't necessarily a punchy contrast day. Uh, it's really learning to, there's a thing called figure ground relationship. And the thing that you're photographing, when we see in color, uh, just to kind of run off on this tangent real quick, when we see in color, colors separate themselves naturally. But when you look at the tonal ranges of those colors, they end to they tend to blend in more often than not. So you want to look at tonal values and actually look at highlights to shadows and placing whatever it is that's the subject of your photo uh, on whatever it is that's the opposite. If it's a highlight that you're shooting, you're placing it on a shadow, or if it's a shadow that you're shooting, you're placing it on a highlight and really playing off of that. So the biggest thing is uh, really, and I mean, this is, this is one of the core elements of photography in the first place is to see tonal range and tonal values. So that's the number one thing. If you were to go out there and focus on, on seeing tonal, uh, proportions and in ranges and how different tones play off of the others, you'll, within the next two weeks, you'll be a much better black and white photographer. I guarantee couldn't agree with you more. I think one of the, the, the first things that anybody should learn, uh, whether they're doing uh, uh, film or digital or any kind of photography or just sticking with their iPhone is, how do you look at a scene? How do you judge it exactly that way? And how do you use your light meter? Mm-hmm. Um, there are, and, and that's no joke. It, it's it, it, There have been a couple of classes that I've taught. There have been a couple of folks that I've dealt with. And one of the things that I find stunning, um, people who've been shooting for years... Um, and, and hoping to get this and that or the other. And then you ask them a simple thing. Do you know how to use light meter? And do you know how to, you know, measure light? Do you know how to judge light with your eyes? So few people like get caught up on that. Sure. Um, and I think it has to do with the paradox, you know, sure. of like, okay, wait a minute. If I want to have, um, you know, my shadows uh, bring out, well, then I have to meter for the highlights. If I want to have, you know, if I want to bring my highlights in and make those strong and have really deep shadows, then I have to, you know, it, it's it's something that 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 people get tripped up on a lot. Um, people should yes learn to lose your learn to use your uh, light meter, please. Sure. Everybody sure. or or yes. learn to. I mean, one of the things too is learning Sunny Sixteen. I feel is one of the best ways to actually see tonal ranges because you'll start to meter and measure light with your eye, and you'll start to realize okay, so it might be bright sunny daylight, but I'm actually I'm shooting something that's that's backlit. So I'm actually metering with my eye for the shadow. So what's the tonal range of that shadow? And, and when you start to learn that, you start to see where different tonal ranges start to separate and it, it kind of lends into the other thing of, of being able to see the, the figure ground relationship and, and everything like that. So I think another thing, you know, if we're talking street, uh, learning to be able to meter with your eye, you're going to be much more uh, well equipped to approach any situation out there versus having to pull a camera up to your eye and then meter and then shoot, you can have it metered uh, before you get to approach the scene. So I don't know, I just, I love the Sunny 16. It's, I, I pull the, the meter out for my wedding work just because it has to be precise and you know, it's, it's work that I'm delivering to a client, but uh, at the same time, I can, I can nail it nine times out of 10 with, with just my eye, just because you learn to see different lighting situations, especially if, 
if you hone in on a certain film stock in a certain speed that, I mean, I'm shooting 99% of my work is HP5 push two stops and I just know it. It, it. I walk into a situation and I don't even have to look at the light. I know what I'm walking Click. into. Yeah. yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's such a, a amazing tool to have in your tool belt. It kind of expands on that one camera, one lens approach where you get used to a single bit of equipment. When you're shooting film, just bring the element of which film are you used to and, and just getting better at that specific system and kind of making it an extension of your own arm, of your own eye. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, so I can't find the name on this, but it was, a, uh, it was kind of a two-part question here. Uh, developer, what's your developer of choice? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, where where we get yeah this, this this is one I'm curious about. What developer do you use? Sure. So for the longest time, I've, I've used Ilfasol three. Okay. Uh, I use it at the one to nine, and the the whole reason for that is it's the only developer that's sold locally here in town. Okay. So I I'm like I said, I'm not the greatest at organizing and, and planning and everything like that. So I oftentimes wait until I'm out of developer before I realize that I need more developer. Uh, so it's nice to be able to to just run across town and get that. But at the same time, recently, uh, one of my my followers and friends uh, sent over some HC one ten for me to try, and I've been using that and really enjoying it. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you another recommendation, and 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 maybe I'll even send a bottle your way. Um, uh, uh, if you can get your hands on some Adox uh, Rodenol, mm. um, if you like things grainy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the developer for you. And the sure. beautiful thing about that is, um, it's it, as resilient as a cockroach. It's as resilient <laughs> as a cockroach. Um, the dilutions are, uh, uh, small enough so that, or I should say large enough so that like one bottle will last you a really long time. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you will get, if you like the kind of grainy quality that, that I've seen in some of your stuff, you're going to absolutely love it, especially mm-hmm. paired with HP five yeah. Rodinol HP five, just wow. Beautiful nice. stuff. Really beautiful nice. but prepare yourself because you're going to be looking at like a 21 minute long development time. Oh yeah. <laughs> and you're like, okay. Yeah. But you also have <laughs> a like six year shelf life. Yes. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Cause sure. I like it. I like Emphasol too. And, or Emphasol. But its shelf life is this side about what four six months. They're yeah. about before it yeah, browns out. That, once it's once it's opened, I mean, yeah. especially when you get down to a half a bottle or less, it it exhausts pretty quick. And that was one of the things that drove me nuts about it. I have seen some tips that people use marbles, like trying yep. to keep the air uh, out, and they'll drop more and more marbles into it into Take the bottle the as the volume. yeah. So it mm-hmm. takes the liquid up to the edge to keep as little air inside as possible sure. which with Ilfasol you could actually do that because it is a true liquid uh developer um for for other things that are more gel based you know uh, hc 110 just pours out like honey <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Glute, i'm trying glute. to yeah exactly it's <laughs> it's crazy the one thing that i have noticed with the hc 110 is uh my negatives and i didn't realize this until after i scratched a few negatives my negatives come out a little bit more gummy uh, when they're developed, so they're a little bit softer and a little bit more uh, fragile than Ilfasol 3. Ilfasol 3, when I pulled it out of the tank, I could, I, I would just run my fingers down to squeegee off the my wet fingers. It's not like I have calloused fingers or anything, but running wet fingers you get those down soft the soft hands. <laughs> yeah. I have long hair and I put coconut oil in it, so they're just always conditioned. People are like, you have the softest hands. I'm like, it's the coconut oil. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm right there with you. <laughs> But, uh, that's why we have long hair, so we can have greasy hands for film. That's well, right. <laughs> exactly. You, uh, yeah, but uh, see, I don't need the long hair. My hands are naturally greasy. <laughs> so it's, it's just, there's there's a thick coat of something on there that, that nice. you know. Oh, my word. Uh, but no, you, you're you right. Can, yeah. Maybe you could answer about the, the rodinol, uh, Pete. Is it, does it come out pretty fragile after rodinol? Is, is it pretty no. bulletproof? Or? It's, it's, it's very bulletproof. Cool. Um, and, and you're talking with someone, well, okay, um, when I go to develop my own film, I've, I've managed to jerry-rig uh, uh, a place uh, out back of my house where I develop my film. Um, Your shed? I'm, I'm, my shed. It, it literally <laughs> looks, it could be a scene from like a Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. <laughs> The rusty um, chain is just hanging the, right above exactly, you, like in. you know, and the moldy wood and the nails sticking oh, out for no apparent reason, and and uh, 
if you look at it, I think that there are a lot of diehard film folk who would probably look at the setup that I have and just hang their head in shame for even associating with me that I would think about developing my stuff in a place like that. But um, look, you go with what you got. Sure. So, um, you know, I, I developed the road and all. Uh, one of the things I started to do because we had the drought here in California was, okay, try and minimize as much of the tap water uh, as possible. And so I go out and I buy myself distilled water. It uh, mm. makes it a little bit more expensive. Um, but the, the beauty about it is I'm not taking uh, uh, water out of the tap here uh, when you have things like droughts. But also you get super clean water. You mix your mm. chems with that stuff. And um, you're going to have a more, well, a cleaner outcome where that starts to hit the fan is inevitably you're going to probably stick that film under the tap water to wash it. Because if you got a five minute or a 10 minute wash on it, trying to constantly, you know, all right, every minute you add in new distilled water and then shake it for about a minute and then repeat for like five minutes, 10 minutes, that tends to get a little bit tedious. So if you do it in the tap, you pull it out, and there's going to be, once it dries, there are going to be mineral deposits on it. Mm-hmm. That's where you put in the photo flow. You stick it in mm-hmm. the photo flow, and one of the things that I've stopped doing is actually sque- squeegeeing my, uh, uh, my nags because I found that you can scratch the emulsion really bad. Um, uh, but um, uh, now with the Rodinol, it's your nags come out looking wonderful. They're ironclad. Um, they, 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 will not, they will not be harmed. Nice. Yeah, because that's just, I've noticed that I didn't get much dust on my Ilfasol nags, mm. uh, but the the emulsion being so gummy has really kind of started to attract dust that I'm not used to, uh, yeah. and it's kind of frustrating to me. But at the same time, I have been enjoying HC-110, but I would love to try Rodno. Uh, people have told me about it for a while. Well, I mean, I, I see by the film that you have back there, um, it, it, at least you're not hanging your film in a woodshed. <laughs> Those will be your woodshed years. When people talk back on your photography, these, oh, these were his woodshed it's, years. You can see the, the bark at the bottom here. <laughs> it's, it's your barn period. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Look at these wonderful scratches. <laughs> not, to, not to push this along, but I do want to go ahead and throw to this. It was a second part question. What they were saying mm-hmm. was what to do with chemicals after. Ah. Sure. So Nick, you don't Nick, want Nick, to do you kill do? the environment. Yeah, what do, you, what do you do with your chemicals, Nick? Yeah, I just pour them out the back window and they just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> You're better than me. I just poured out the car driving down the highway. <laughs> really? Oh, See, because I, I usually serve it to unwanted guests as cocktails. Well, Wine. <laughs> mm. There you go. Yeah. No, I... Uh, so for, for Fixer, I bring it over to the local college, the art college and they have a whole process for stripping silver and hard metals, oh, and uh, nice. and they will dispose of it for me. So good, nice, good. So nice. local university, local college, some place that offers. Oh, typically, there's still plenty of places around in in most areas. Most universities, uh, well, hopefully, at least around me, most universities are still doing darkroom uh, stuff, and will help you to dispose of that properly. So. Okay, one of the other things that you can do out there, if, if you don't have an area that will um, uh, reclaim the silver uh, from your fixer, um, you can always go check out your um, whatever your local mun- municipality has for uh, household hazardous waste. Mm. Um, they'll, they'll take your chemicals. Um, it, it's, what is it? They say with uh, things like developer um, and hypoclear and stop bath that, that they're somewhat okay to pour down the drain. Um, in certain developers, I would say, yeah, but it's uh, the dilution ratio too. Is- it's, it's uh, the dilution ratios. It also depends on the sewage system. Where exactly is this water going? Yeah. What kind of treatment mm-hmm. plant do you got? Or if and you're where- rural and you got a cistern or something like that, <laughs> septic right. tank. You know. Something, something like that. So the the better bet would be, um, and again, this goes back to, uh, I actually have a process where, I, since I buy gallons of distilled water, um, I save those emptied out gallons as those okay. Those are my waste gallons that I will pour the waste chemicals in. I usually separate the fixer from like the developer and the water stop bath and the hypoclear, 
and sure. separate the things and you know the stuff that that you can't reclaim silver out of just bring it down to the household hazardous waste look them up folks your county actually has them they're on the website you can find them and i bet you they'll take your chems away for you oh i'm sure they will google is your friend yeah <laughs> and you don't want to yeah for anybody listening you definitely don't want to uh mix your developer and fixer uh, into the same bottle. Those will produce a very, very toxic gas that you do not want to be breathing in. So yes. I have heard there's a there's a way of like decanting uh, fixer. Using a, a steel, uh, steel wool, yeah, steel right? wool pad. Yeah. But I put it in, I don't know if I did it wrong or if I was expecting something. I, I don't know what to expect, but I put it in there and it just like disintegrated the, the steel wool and yeah, I don't know. So I got a bucket out on the porch where I tried the same concept. I think I, I just became like uh, an alchemist and created my own new metal. I don't really know what the fuck is happening. Something was floating around on the top and I wasn't sure what it was. And yeah. I, yeah, I was like, well, okay, new I'll colors, that one off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. Uh, one of the, uh, go ahead and end it with a couple more questions here. Um, do you have a photographer that you want to recommend for our listeners to check out? Sure. Can I do a couple of quick ones? Absolutely. Oh, okay. you can do a couple of long ones if you'd like. <laughs> sure. Uh, one of the ones that we talked about earlier uh, is Jay Maisel. We talked about his quote that he threw out there, but I uh, absolutely love Jay Maisel. He's shaped so much of uh, the way that I think about approaching street and, and street photography. And uh, I know that Kelby One or Kelby Training or whatever they call themselves now had uh, three amazing, amazing uh, they were like an interview series, but it was them walking around with Jay Maisel on the streets of New York and on the streets of Paris, and they were absolutely fantastic. Uh, so Jay Maisel is one that I absolutely love. Uh, Ralph Gibson is also a, a classic. I'm sure probably a lot of the listeners may have heard of both of those, but Ralph, Gip- Ralph Gibson has uh, been a huge influence on shaping the direction of my current work and uh, just where I want to bring my work. And then the last one is Kit Young. Uh, his handle on Instagram is Kit Young 135, uh, as in 135 film. And Kit is one of those guys who is uh, just a beast with the camera. The things that he creates and how he's cre- able to create the vast work and the vast body that he's been able to create in the years that he's been shooting, uh, it's almost like he can't take a bad photo. And it's frustrating in so many different instances. Uh, and I know it's, he's, he's also an amazing darkroom printer. He doesn't share anything except for his darkroom prints. And I know that he's an amazing uh, color of his work. So he's very selective on the work that he does share. And, uh, and it lets off this Superman uh, aspect of him that you just think he's completely unreal. <laughs> and uh yeah kit's a kit's a great friend and just an amazing amazing photographer so i think anybody would be inspired by his work great recommendation and you're right about that i mean it comes down to you will always be judged by the weakest link in your portfolio sure sure so never hesitate to kill the babies and cull it down and keep on culling mm-hmm. it, it, go ahead okay, okay i got i got i got one last question for you and, and, and we're going to throw this one out here. Let, let's go into the la-la land of what if. Sure. Um, if you could photograph any place and time since the inception of the camera, where would you do it? Why would you do it? And how would you do it? Sure. Uh, I was thinking about this one, knowing that you guys were going to ask it. And I think the best answer that I could give is probably the uh, 50s. And just the whole Rat Pack era, the whole... Uh, Miles Davis era, and just being able to see these guys operating at their prime, uh, I would absolutely love to just document so much of, have you guys seen the Sammy Davis Jr. photo book? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. and and just seeing so much of the behind the scenes of Duke Ellington, and you know, like, oh gosh, these guys are amazing, and to be able to go back and, and see some of these guys perform that I've never been able to see, uh, that are still in, impacting my work and in the work of many others, uh, I would love to go and honor them with my, my Leica and just photograph them and, and just chase them down and, and play complete fanboy of, of just uh, <laughs> entertainment photojournalism. <laughs> Co- color or black and white? Oh, black and white. Hands oh, down. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hands yeah. down. 
And depending on the situation, if you took it deep, you could, you know, get some photos of them working with their mafia ties. And there you go, <laughs> exactly right. Okay, just get go wrapped the... into that whole thing and go down that rabbit trail. <laughs> yeah, see old blue eyes talking about people with concrete boots. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You just pray that you're never on the other end of uh, that conversation. You're just like, man, I'm I'm happy to be in the room with these guys because they're not talking about me. No. Right, right. That's that's one of those moments where it's good to ask permission. Well, I was, yeah. was going to say, like, do you remember the opening wedding scene in The Godfather when, like, the the photographer comes up and takes a picture of the old dude and he like points out of one of his you know heavies? <laughs> hey, man, that guy right there. A guy goes over, grabs his camera, smashes it to the ground. Right. Uh, that's probably, that probably Nick, did happen back in the day. Yeah, be careful. That's yeah. why you take yeah. it like it, because it would break the ground, not the yeah. camera. Exactly. Yeah. And just bounce back up into my hand, and I keep shooting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. That's a great response. Well, let's go ahead and throw it out there. Where can our listeners uh, see more of your work and uh, and see you in action? Sure. Uh, biggest places, I have a website. It's nickexposed.com, but honestly, it's uh, it's broken right now. Uh, we switched platforms, and the back end broke. So until I'm able to switch it over to something that I could actually post on, it's just <laughs> all of my old posts. So don't go there. Uh, check out Instagram, Nick Exposed. Uh, you could also check out Nick Exposed on YouTube. And then also uh, you can check out, I also have a film photography apparel line uh, that is over at Two Stops Apparel, and uh, that's on Instagram, and then twostopsapparel.com, and that's one that I, I update more and more. Is that the hat you got on there? The T-shirt, all sorts of stuff. Film, film related, everything over there. Coffee mugs, stickers, and uh, and everything. Super proud of that. Okay, that so line. so you got the you got the hat on, and and is it also a shirt as well? Or yeah, so it's a it says Film League on this one, then it's got nice. the Pentax six seven on the back. So it's kind of a play off of yeah. I, uh, I just okay. recently gave away my. I, w- I was just gonna say quick a quick question on that one. How long have you shot with a Pentax six seven? Uh, I shot with it for about a year, and then just recently sold it to to buy my Sumacron from Alika. Okay, there you go. And 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 what what did you think of that tank of a thing? It's amazing. I mean, the the one hundred five two point four is the reason why I bought that lens, and it lived up to everything that it was ever made out to be. Uh, it's it, it's almost like shooting four by five. And the only reason why I was happy with not happy. I mean, I've. I've spent a couple nights crying ever since selling that thing, but uh, uh, the only reason why I was able to let it go out of my hands was because I do have a 4x5 and I could still, you know, play off of that whole, you know, 4x5 ratio and everything, but that's an amazing, amazing camera. It's, oh, there you go. Yeah. No, I, I was going to say, because I've been an owner of the, I've been an owner of exactly that camera for about 17 years, and that thing, I, I often like to describe it as... Um, um, not only is it a fantastic camera that makes beautiful photos, but it's also a great way to defend yourself if people are attacking you. <laughs> yes, that's um, true. And it's good for training your arms, you know? That's yes. right. That's <laughs> like, right. Yeah, you, uh, you won't be too scared to walk down some back alleys with that one in your hands. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty intimidating weapon. <laughs> well, Pete, where can we find out more uh, about your work at? Oh, my God, you actually want me to plug my stuff. Of course. Um, that's what you get for being a guest host. That's what I get for being a guest host. Uh, you can, if you want to check out some of the stuff that I have, I have, um, it's 2812photo.photoshelter.com. And uh, I'm on Instagram as 2812photography and 2812 on paper, two different accounts. The uh, 2812 photography is just sort of a, vomitous mass of my Instagram for several years and the 2812 on paper is literally nothing but uh, uh, prints um, both inkjet prints but primarily uh, uh, darkroom prints that I have on there and you can find me wandering around in Berkeley or San Francisco just look for this strange face <laughs> excellent well you can find out uh, more information about me at recasper.com that's going to be my workshops all of my recent uh, blog posts find me on instagram at recasperphoto uh, but more importantly go take a look at streetpx.com that's where you're going to find all of our episodes including this show if you're listening to us on hangouts right now live it's going to be posting on friday if it's after friday then welcome to the past um, or t- <laughs> take a look at all of our other videos. We also have merchandise. Uh, if you're looking at the video now, I've got one of my shirts on street PX right nice. here. Uh, we also have, uh, about 24 shirts with illustrated cameras, everything from a uh, wonderful Leica four to uh, Nikon, uh, 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 
things, my brain just went completely to, to, to mush. Um, I even got an Argus brick on that bitch. So <laughs> if you want a cool t-shirt, go check it out in the merch store. Uh, above all, we do love reviews. Go take a look at us on iTunes. Throw us some uh, reviews. Throw us some stars. And then when you're done there, go take a look at Nick Exposed. What he, the links he was just dropping in and grab you one of his t-shirts too. So thank you so much, Nick, for coming on the show. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. And please keep doing what you're doing because, um, you know, out of a lot of the camera folks that uh, uh, that that do their vlog, do their blog type of thing, um, you're one of the few people that I've seen uh, over the over the years that actually has me perking up my eyebrows and and being like, okay, th- that's it, spot on, N- nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. Please go watch this. <laughs> thanks, man. I appreciate that, and I'll definitely keep on. Excellent. Cool. Well, thank you all out there in our audience, uh, our both live audience uh, right now in the Hangout, as well as you listening on your phones or computers later. Uh, if you are liking the show, go to patreon.com forward slash streetpx and give a buck, give five bucks, whatever you give us. We'll go back into keeping our mics hot and our bandwidth flowing. Cool. Till next time, everybody. Cheers and keep on shooting. Mm-hmm.